now we're going to learn about potential energy and conservation of energy. So let's start with what is potential energy? It is energy that could be turned back into kinetic energy. Um, something, energy that you could do something with. So the most, easy, the most easy to understand is gravitational potential energy. So if you have a ball flying through the air, at the beginning, the, whoever kicks it or throws it does some work on the ball, which gives it some kinetic energy. Um, and then as it travels up in the air, the, um, the, um, it hit the ball, um, the ball does, gravity does work on the ball as the ball flies up in the air. So the ball is, um, is losing energy. And then when it, so it's, it's kinetic energy decreases, the potential energy increases. Um, at its highest point, it actually stops. We saw this when we worked with, kinet with the kinematic equations that at the top of a trajectory, something is not moving. Um, and then as it goes, um, as it falls back down, it starts to speed up and the poten potential energy decreases. And then it reaches, uh, it's re reaches its maximum kinetic energy again when it reaches the ground. So, at, so here, at, at the bottom, the kinetic energy is maximum. But when it is, um, as it, is it, when it's at the very top, the um, kinetic energy is at its minimum, but the potential energy is at its maximum. So here you can have the, a, a bungee jumper falling down the, the bungee jumper's potent, gravitational potential energy at the very beginning is, um, is converted into uh, elastic potential energy at the bottom and then um, as the, well, at the very middle, in the middle, it's all kinetic energy because the bungee jumper is going really, really super fast. And then um, as the bungee jumper continues to fall, um, the bungee cord gets stretched out and then you have potential energy from the, the bungee cord being stretched. So here, if you're going up a hill, so at the, the bottom, your potential energy is lowest. As you go down, um, your potential energy decreases. You can also have potential energy due to springs. So if you have a, a spring at its equilibrium position, if you pull it down, it has, your increase is in increasing its potential energy. And then as it flies back up, at some point the spring is compressed. So at equilibrium, all of the energy is kinetic. And then as it, as it um, flies up, you end up getting more potential energy. So if you plot the, um, so what actually happens with a spring is that it will bounce back and forth about its equilibrium position. And as it does this, what's going on is that the, um, the, kinematic, the kinetic energy is at um, a minimum at the top and at the bottom, and it's at a maximum in the middle. So you have um, potential energy going up and down and up and down and up and down, back and forth. We can also consider conservative versus non-conservative forces. In the last chapter, I talked about gravity and how if you consider the work done by gravity, it doesn't depend on the path which is taken. Um, so gravity is an example of a, non of a conservative force. Um, when you have a conservative force, um, you can have different um, you can have a different distribution between uh, the potential and the kinetic energy depending on where you are in the trajectory, um, but the total amount of energy will be the same. So at least an ideal, for at least an ideal spring, that uh, it is, it's a conservative force. So as the spring, as the mass oscillates back and forth, you change the distribution of potential and kinetic energy, but the total amount of energy stays the same. Um, an example here is when you have a particle hung from a string. Um, this is a simple pendulum, and you can, using conservation of energy, you can actually consider several different, um, you can consider, consider several different problems. So at the very top of its trajectory, so in this case it's 30 degrees, um, it, its potential energy is, uh, is maximum, but it's, uh, kinetic energy is minimum. So here, 
if I want to figure out how fast it is going at the bottom, even if I don't know um, exactly how it gets there, the um, initial potential energy is mvh. The initial uh, kinetic energy is zero because it starts at rest. The final potential energy is zero. And the final potential energy is one half m v final squared. So I can find the final um, the final velocity simply by using energy conservation. So the final velocity is equal to the square root of two g h independent of how it got there. So in this case, you have a helicopter um, that has a panel fall. And as it falls, the, um, the panel loses energy um, due to air resistance. And it ends up with um, it ends up with less energy. At the end, um, you can when it uh, when it reaches its terminal velocity, it has some final height. Um, this total height of energy, this total amount of energy, is less than what you started with. The amount of energy which was lost due to air resistance is the difference. There are different types of potential energy, so. There's, of course, gravitational potential energy. So here, if you have um, the, so you can plot the energy as a function of the height above the ground. And the energy is just mgy. So the higher you, you go, the greater your potential energy. Um, and nothing particularly deep. Later, when we cover gravity, we'll talk about how Actually, because the force is not exactly mg, you have some gravitational potential, um, which depends on the distance from the center of the Earth. Um, if you're considering things that are far away from the Earth, you do a slightly different, you, you have a slightly different form, but the same basic idea. Um, here you have uh, potential energy to the spring. So a common physics ex uh, intro physics experiment is to have a glider on a, uh, an air track, which is connected to both sides of the air track by springs. Um, and then you have a potential energy due to the spring itself. So the potential energy is 1 half kx squared for a spring. Um, and you can draw, this is a potential energy diagram for the system. So here on the y-axis, you have the energy. On the x-axis, you have the displacement. And um, this shows your potential energy. And for any given point of total energy, um, the, dis the, the kinetic energy is the distance between um, the total energy and the potential energy. So this is how much. E um, how much potential energy, how much kinetic energy you have at different points, at, at different points. So you can view this conceptually as very much like having a marble in a bowl that it um, it has a turning point, and so at the very top, when it's rolling around, it has no kinetic energy, but it's at its maximum potential energy, and at the bottom it has its maximum kinetic energy, but it has no potential energy. Here you can see some arbitrary um, graph. You could calculate um, if you're given the potential energy um, as a function of position. You can calculate if this is your total energy, what your kinetic energy is. That might seem somewhat arbitrary, but later you, um, you will be introduced to forces such as the strong force, where we don't have an exact equation for what it is but we can still come up with an approximation for the potential energy. Um, and, so, and then you can figure out what the kinetic energy is for some arbitrary functional shape. Now, on to a few examples. A common physics demonstration. Uh, in a common physics demonstration, a professor pulls a bowling ball up to, to his nose, touches it with his nose, lets it go. Now, 
the bowling ball is going to go, uh, go swing down and get faster and faster, go up on the other side and come back down, but it doesn't gain any energy. So it's going to stop exactly where it started or actually a little bit further um, away from his nose because there are really some, um, some losses. So does, it get, does he get struck on the ball, by the ball on, his, on its return swing? Not unless someone pushes it. Either that or if he moves his nose, he could get banged. That's all because of, of conservation of energy. Um, so here, a man is skiing across level ground at a certain speed. He comes up to a small slope. Um, if he coasts up the hill, what is, um, what is his speed when he reaches the top of the plateau? Assume friction between the snow and the skis is negligible. What is his, um, what is his uh, speed if he reaches, uh, if he does have friction? Okay. So now we're going to say his initial speed. We'll just leave it as V initial. And this is saying, what is his speed when he reaches the top of the hill? Whenever you're doing potential energy problems that involve gravity, you have to choose where you put your zero. So we're just going to choose to put it um, on the ground at the bottom of the hill. So here, his initial Potential energy is zero. His initial kinetic energy is one half m v initial squared. Um, and then we have because we are, and then we have the the final potential energy is going to be m g h. We will call this h. So this is m g h. The final kinetic energy is one half m v final squared. So we have one half m v initial squared equals one half m v final squared plus m g h. I got a bunch of m's I can cancel out. And V final squared. Ah, I'm going to multiply it through by 2 everywhere. V final squared is equal to V initial, the square root of V, I'm sorry, V initial, V final is equal to the square root of V initial squared minus 2GH. All right, now let's add some loss due to friction. Um, the loss due to friction here, we're going to say this is theta. And we have done the problem with an inclined plane enough that I can just write down that the magnitude of friction is mu sub k because we are talking about kinetic friction. And then m g cosine theta. And then our work done. So the system loses energy. So now I'm going to have the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy equals the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy plus the work done by friction. So now I have 1 half m v initial squared equals 1 half m v final squared plus m g h plus mu sub k m g and then delta x cosine theta and this is my delta x 8 meters again 
I have M's in everything. And I'm going to want to multiply through by 2. And I am left with my final speed. My final velocity is the initial squared minus 2gh minus 2 mu k g delta x cosine theta. Okay. Erase this. So I don't like plugging numbers in. It's left as an exercise for the student to plug numbers in. It's a classic physics joke. You say something is left as an exercise for the student, and it it means five pages of algebra later you can actually get the answer. Really, this shouldn't be that hard. I like leaving it general and writing things as variables so that it gets you in the habit of leaving everything as variables until the very end. Most students start plugging numbers in as soon as they get going. And if you make a mistake, it's hard to fix it. All right, a small block of mass m slides without friction around the loop buoy. If the block starts from rest at a, um, what, is, what is its speed at b? And then um, what is the force of the track on the block at B. So this is another one where we're asked to put a lot of things together. So this picture is not to scale. This is 4R, and this height has to be 2R. And this is a height of R. So the picture is not to scale in the slightest. All right. If it starts, so we're neglecting friction. If it starts at rest, what's its speed at B? So now we can write that the poten initial potential energy is mg times 4r. The initial kinetic energy is equal to 0 because it is at rest. The final kinetic en potential energy is mg R, because the block is a height R above the ground. And then the kinetic energy is, is what we're after, 1 half mv final squared. Now I can put this in, the total initial energy is equal to the total final energy. Again, I have masses that I can cancel throughout. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to multiply through by 2. And I have 8 mgr minus 2 mgr, or 6 m g r is equal to v final squared or the final velocity is equal to the square root of 6 m or of 6 g r i put the m back in i have the m i have the wrong units so 6 g r all right what is the force of the track on the block at b all right, now at B, the block um, has to be moving. In, uh, so when you have something moving with a constant velocity, so the track, in this case, gravity is perpendicular, so the force cannot be acting, the normal force from the track cannot be acting to keep it on the 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 force keeping it on the tr moving in a circle cannot come from gravity. It's got to come from the track. So for something moving in a circle, the acceleration is equal to v squared over r. 
the force is mass times acceleration. I now have the velocity. Um, and then I can calculate that this is m over r times 6gr. And my r's cancel out. Or I have 6mg, or 6 times the gravitational force. Just moving in the center. All right. So now I think you're hopefully starting to see how using conservation of energy serves you well. If you had to solve this problem with kinematics, you would have to consider the, the force on the, um, on the mass everywhere along its trajectory. When you're able to use conservation of energy, you don't have to consider the force on the mass. You just have to, um, you just assume that you have energy conservation and you can calculate the velocity from there. A skier with some initial speed coasts up a, up an H, ri a rise of height H, um, as shown. Find her final speed at the top. Given that the coefficient of kinetic, uh, uh, coefficient of friction between her skis and the snow is mu sub k. All right. So here we can say the initial potential energy plus the Initial kinetic energy equals the final potential energy plus the, um, uh, I keep writing the wrong letter, plus the, um, so basically total energy is constant. So initial potential energy plus initial kinetic energy equals the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy plus the amount of work done uh, by friction. So her initial kinetic energy is 1 half mv initial squared. Her initial, oh, sorry, that's the initial kinetic energy. I wrote it as potential. The initial potential energy is equal to 0. The final potential energy is mgh. This diagram has a very specific height, but I have left it vague. And then this we're going to just call theta, as usual. The final kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv final squared. The amount of work done is m g uh, sorry it, it's going to be the normal force so here we're going to our friction let's write let's go over here friction is e going to equal the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force which is m g cosine theta um, and so our work done is mu sub k m g cosine theta and then times the distance. So here, if this is delta x and we have let me call this L. We have uh, sine theta is equal to H over delta X, the way that I have drawn this. So delta X is equal to H over sine theta. In this case, the smaller the angle, the longer the slope. That makes sense. So now we're going to multiply by 
our delta x, which is h sine theta, or mu sub k m v h over the tangent of theta. So if our so then if we uh, if we try to find her final speed, we can write this big expression one half m v initial squared equals m v h plus one half m v final squared plus mu sub k m g ah, I'm running out of space so I'll creep down onto the next line plus mu sub k m v h over tangent of theta all right I got my m's but I can cancel out and I will again multiply everywhere by 2 V final equals the square root of V initial squared minus 2GH minus 2 mu sub K G H over tangent of theta. So once you know that you have energy conservation, you start out, you write your total equation you're starting with, you write each of the pieces. Try to be meticulous about how you plug numbers in so that you don't um, lose track of what you put down. I strongly recommend leaving everything as variables until the very end. Um, and then when you have all of your expressions, plug it all in. Okay, this problem. What is the initial gravitational potential of the system and what is the final kinetic energy of the system? Um, it's going to depend a little bit on how we draw our coordinates. So the problem in the book says that mass 2 is much, much greater than mass 1. And we need to know that because that tells us which way the um, the system uh, um, which way the system moves. Uh, and how you draw this is going to depend on. Well, we're going to go ahead and put our y upwards because we're going to be dealing with potential energy. And when we're dealing with potential energy, it's easier to use coordinates lined up with gravity. Let's say that this is a, an initial height, h, above the ground. And these are lined up so their centers of masses are, um, are roughly equivalent. So. Then if we say, what is, so, and we're going to ask the question, what happens when this mass hits the ground? That's the second part. So what's the initial gravitational potential energy? It is going to be m1 plus m, actually, let me go ahead and write, um, write this. The potential energy is equal to m1 plus m2 times g h. For the final potential energy, we have to figure out, so the mass 2 hits the ground, so it has no potential energy. But when mass 2 has gone a length h, we then can draw a triangle for it. We need to know how far the um, mass 1 has gone. When mass 2 falls a length h, mass 1 has moved the length h. 
So this is h, this is theta, and we want to know what this height is. So we can say sine theta, and let me call this delta y. Sine theta is equal to delta y over h. So delta y is equal to h sine theta. So our potential energy at the end is m1 h sine theta times g. And then our initial kinetic energy is equal to zero. And to get the final kinetic energy, this is equal to the initial kinetic, the initial potential energy minus the initial, minus the, let me write out the, the whole equation. I'm tripping up over my words. And if I trip up, you can trip up too. So this is why I always say, write out the whole equation first. You do as I say, not as I do. Doesn't work on my kids either. Okay, so this is your energy conservation equation. We have no initial kinetic energy. We are after the final kinetic energy which is the difference in, is the initial potential energy. Minus the final potential energy. And if we wanted to solve this for the final velocity, They both are moving at the same velocity. Velocity. So I can set this equal to this mess. The final velocity, I'm going to multiply everything. By... 2 over m1 plus m2, and I get the final velocity is equal to the square root of 2 m1 plus m2 g h minus 2 m1 g h sine theta divided by m1 plus m2. Oops, I need a square root. Ugly, but it'll get you there. So here I can ask all sorts of variations on these questions. I like to take the problems that were asked in the book and manipulate them a little bit, show you how you could ask a slightly different question show you how to think your way inside and outside the problem. There is actually a finite number of physics problems that we could even ask and solve. So if you get the, if you start thinking about what other types of questions someone could ask along these lines, you can come up with, a, with all possible sets, a complete set of problems that someone could actually ask on an intro physics exam be a lot of problems, but it's not infinite. Because most many problems are still not solvable. All right, so with that, we're going to end this chapter, and I'll see you for the next one.